All right. Well, uh, thank you, Aaron. And let me just say a quick word here as I make this more appropriate for the height. Uh, <laughs> I want to, uh, want to thank Christ Baptist Church for uh, putting this together. Uh, I know this is uh, it's a sensitive issue. It's a difficult issue in some ways. And I'm very grateful uh, that they would entrust me and and uh, Dr. Roach here to, to lead us through this time. And again, thank you for your attendance. And it's my prayer that what will come tonight would be clarity on this issue and uh, that we would, we would come away with uh, having been helped with this. So a uh, couple of things here. Uh, again, what, if the Lord blesses in the way that I've prayed and I know that Bill has prayed, we, we're praying for clarity and deeper understanding of these issues. And number two... As Christians, I'm, I'm primarily addressing us as Christians, that God would give us a deeper commitment to do what Rod Dreher says, and I'm borrowing the title of his book, and that is to live not by lies, but to live according to the truth as it relates to this issue. So here's what will happen. I'm going to talk for a bit here, and uh, after that, Bill will come up, and, and Aaron, I think, and we'll have a bit of a discussion and then we more than welcome you. If you have a question, again, let me just reiterate, come to one of these mics. We'll have time for you to ask your question, and we will do the very best we can to help you with those. All right, let's, let's get right into it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5, Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. This would be familiar to many of us. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to pull down strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The clear assumption in this passage, and it's as clear as day, in fact, without this assumption, these verses that I just read, and more than that, the rest of the Bible make absolutely no sense at all. Here's the assumption. Truth is objective. That means it's true whether or not you and I affirm it or not. It's true independently of our minds and of our affirming it. And we can know the truth because God has spoken clearly. And we can run, and we must run, all of the ideas that we encounter, the philosophies, the worldviews, through this knowledge that God has given us in His Word. That is, that's what Paul's talking about when he's talking about taking every thought captive. How can you take a thought captive and set it up next to something that you can't possibly know? So the Scripture for you and for me as Christians is the standard, not just of what we think, but also of how we think. And we must be careful to do what Paul has instructed us to do here by his own example, to take all of these ideas captive, to make sure that we're agreeing with what God has revealed to us. Well, I thought it would help to just share a story with you that gives you a bit of background of where I'm coming from with this issue, maybe a bit of my heart. I pastored a church, some of you know, uh, for six years, uh, it's about 40 minutes up the road from us here. Was there for six years. Was pretty stunned. I think it was within my first or maybe even the second year. Uh, there was a young guy who had become a Christian. And he was in his 20s. And he uh, was just hungry. This guy wanted to, he was just soaking up anything I'd give him. So what I told him was, I said, hey, let's do this. Let's meet together on Mondays and I will give you half of my day on Mondays. We'll, we'll spend time in prayer, we'll spend time reading the Bible, and we're going to go out into the community and we're going to visit people. And there's an area of the community that in my best I can tell is very much neglected. And in this particular town, it was pretty well divided. There was the black poor community, and then there was the white community. And I said, I don't, there's no real outreach from what I've uh, looked into in the black community. So uh, we were not, of course, neglecting the other areas, but we went to that community. And word came back uh, after we'd done this for some weeks from some of the uh, older people in the church that they did not think we needed to be visiting that area. And I didn't know how many people were upset with this, so I just, the, the person who had the issue didn't come to me. They sent another person. So I said, well, if, if anybody has any issue, 
let them come and talk to me. I'd happily talk to them about this. Because again, as Christians, we believe that all people are made in God's image and that Christ longs and desires the salvation of every human being who's ever walked planet Earth. It's very clear in the Bible. But I said, but if this is an issue that the whole church would together think that and decide that they would not want me visiting that area, this would be a place where uh, we would need to part ways and the church would need to find another pastor. I couldn't agree to that. And so I just say that to let you know that I've stuck my neck out in my own ministry where I've encountered what I would call real racism, real boots on the ground racism. So I come to, to you to, tonight from the perspective of having seen some of this and even been willing to stand against it where I've seen it. However, when it comes to where these issues are today and how we're being talked about in our culture, I am very aware that many are struggling to make sense of this whole discussion. And we're hearing terms like, Bill, you mentioned the woke movement, social justice, critical race theory, intersectionality, equity versus equality. And if we do not take the time to understand what these ideas, these philosophies mean, even as well-meaning as we might be, I think that we're going to be led down a path that the Lord would not have us to go down. And so my goal now, I just want to walk through some of these terms and just explain them and give some comment to you on, uh, from a Christian worldview of how I think we ought to think about these and then I want to try my best to answer the question that has nagged me for, for the last couple of years as I've watched what's happened throughout evangelicalism and even our own denomination. And here's my question. Why has this movement been so compelling to Christians? What is, what is the drawing power of it? Because as you'll see, I'm very convinced that so many of these, these ideas are contrary to a Christian worldview, as well-meaning as the people might be who've adopted them. First of all, let's do critical race theory. Critical race theory. What in the world does this idea mean? What is it about? Well, uh, to, a bit of the history is, if you look into this, you will find that critical race theory was birthed out of postmodernism, which was a philosophy that hit the academic scene in around the 1960s, roughly. What critic, the reason I mentioned postmodernism is because critical race theory, again, is birthed out of that philosophy, and it takes so much of that philosophy with it to the point to where you cannot really understand critical race theory unless you understand postmodernism. And in a sense, to understand one is to understand the other. So let me give you some facets of postmodernism that you will find making the journey over to critical race theory as well, okay? So first of all, there was a skepticism about objective reality and objective truth. That is, the postmodernists doubted that you could really know reality and that you could really know truth. There was massive skepticism about that. In fact, all worldviews or any, any philosophy or worldview that claimed to give an overarching explanation for the world we live in, namely Christianity, was viewed with great suspicion. And that came out of postmodernism. Number two, what counts as knowledge for the postmodern person is not what we typically would think. The typical view of, of what counts for uh, truth and, uh, would be something like this, that which corresponds to reality. If I make a true statement, it's only true if it really describes reality as the way that the reality really is. Does that make sense? Postmodernism does not view truth that way, and it doesn't view knowledge that way. In fact, it views knowledge as having been created by the culture that you live in. So what that means, and that, by the way, will vary from culture to culture. And as you and I know, most of us have lived long enough to very quickly recognize that not all cultures have the same answers to, to the questions that they ask. So what does this mean? Postmodernism was basically saying there is no ultimate truth that is the answer for all of these questions. Truth is relative, and it's located within each different culture. And that's part of what comes along through postmodernism and would be true as well of critical race theory, as we'll see. 
Well, it's a relativistic view of truth, and the other piece of this is that experience is really going to reign supreme. Your experiences that you have are going to be your most sure source of knowledge. The third thing is that knowledge is linked inseparably to power. Knowledge and power are almost interchangeable in the way that they talk about this. So here's what this looks like. Those who are in power in society, they're the ones who decide what is good and true for their society. The cultural creators, they do this in an effort to maintain, this is as the theory goes, in an effort to maintain their own power and to keep all others outside of their group underneath their oppressive thumb. And this power hierarchy that I'm describing, it really does permeate all levels of society, is the view. So the whole system is permeated by this, so that oppression by those in power is both inevitable, you can't avoid it, and it's systemic. It's systemic. It's baked into the whole system. All right, number four. Postmodernism was, they were very clever in that they made it impossible to critique it. You couldn't critique it, and here's why. It's, it's brilliantly, devilishly clever. You cannot ask for evidence to substantiate the claim. That you cannot ask for evidence of this oppression. You can't object if you detect a logical inconsistency in the worldview. And here's why. To do so, you simply further prove that you're playing by the rules of your oppressive society. So if you bring logic to the table and say, hey, you said this here, and now you made a statement here, and we know, based off the way the world really is, the laws of logic, that two contradictory statements cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. So if I said, my wife's back there tonight, you said, oh, your wife's back there? No, my wife's not back there. You'd say, wait a second. You wouldn't just think I'd made a reasonable, had a reasonable discussion with you. You'd think he either lost his mind or something went wrong. Maybe he got confused. But those two things can't both be true. You can't bring that kind of analysis to postmodernism because to do so, the view was you are bringing the laws of logic that Western civilization has adopted as a means of oppressing people outside of the power group. Okay? Now, this is hugely important that we understand this because this is going to spill over. So you literally can't question it. The moment that you question, you simply prove that you yourself are part of the corrupted system. James Lindsay, who's written an excellent book, I don't agree with everything. In fact, Lindsay's an atheist. But he's one of the sharpest minds on this issue. If you read the book, Cynical Theories, he writes this, Criticism from any position deemed powerful tends to be dismissed because it is assumed either to be ignorant or dismissive of the realities of oppression by definition, or it's viewed as a cynical attempt to serve the critic's own interests. You follow that? So you can't criticize it. Now, if all this is the case of postmodernism, then you would simply ask the question, if everything I've just read is the way that things really are, what then's to be done? What do we do? If power works this way and it permeates every aspect of society and in so doing is the means by which those in power maintain their power and oppress everybody else, what is the answer then? What should we do? If the system itself is the problem, it becomes pretty obvious. You have to deconstruct the system, take it apart. In other words, we need a great, you could probably finish the sentence, Reset. Yeah. Well, critical race theory, and you can check it out. I'm not, just, I'm not giving a straw man presentation here of this. The, the, the proponents of this view are openly admit they're borrowing from these ideas. This was birthed out of the postmodern movement in about the 1980s and 1990s. Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw were some of the first scholars to begin to argue this, and it was really in the legal realm at first, but it's exploded and, and permeated, as it, as, it, as it does, every area of life, the theory has. What does the critical piece mean? The word critical in critical race theory, it literally means 
a, to take a critical view of searching out wherever the problems and the corruptions are in the system. It's, it's a, an attempt to do that, to deconstruct the, the civilization. That's, that's what it's trying to do, to find the problems, the oppression, the discrimination. But it also has a bit of Marxism with it. So critical race theory takes postmodernism, and it takes a bit of the way Marx viewed the world, and it really puts them together. So Karl Marx, as we know, was no friend of Christians. He was no friend to a, a theistic worldview, a view where God really exists. He viewed the world basically according to oppressors and the oppressed. And he viewed those who had the economic well-being, those were the oppressors, and everybody underneath them were the oppressed. Now, to be fair, did Marx point to some real problems as he looked at child labor laws and a host of other things? Absolutely he did. But fundamentally, the view of looking at all of humans as this category of oppressors and oppressed, he, he said that's really the lens through which you have to understand all of humanity. Critical race theory agrees with that. It simply takes the discussion out of the economic realm and it brings it into the discussion of race. So that now you view the majority race in Western civilization, which would be the white people, uh, you view them as the oppressors and the minorities in a descending hierarchical order, depending upon the level to which they are minorities and the, the true and tragic history of our nation. With respect to this, it views those as the oppressed. And that's the lens through which you have to understand uh, humanity. It is a paradigm. Critical race theory, it is not, let me say this, it is not simply some ideas to think uh, to think about, critical race theory truly is a paradigm to think with, a way to view the world and all of reality, okay? And, and that's just what it is. Well, that's critical race theory. Now, one of the major tenets of critical race theory is something else you've heard, and it's just simply called systemic racism or systemic oppression. You cannot have critical race theory without this. If you take this away, you don't have critical race theory, Okay, what's the idea with systemic racism? Now here it is, and please listen carefully, because I want to be as clear as I can here uh, on this point. It's very important. Systemic racism is the idea that racism is baked into every area, every sphere of Western civilization. That means what I described just a little bit earlier. Everything from the laws of logic to the scientific method, the idea that we can go out together regardless of our race or our gender or our socioeconomic status, that any person could go out and examine the natural world and, and, and find a true conclusion about that. We can all count the tree rings on the tree. We can all put the, the, the Bunsen burner, uh, uh, put the chemical up to the Bunsen burner, and the same color comes out for all of us when we put the chemicals there. That idea, even of the scientific method, is viewed as uh, having racism baked in. The U.S. Constitution, our school system, the police force, the business world, the entertainment industry, and I'm looking at the time, I better stop, but I could keep going and going and going and just giving you, but the point is every institution or facet of Western civilization is inherently racist. And that is the conclusion because if you've already assumed that knowledge, the way that people think, and therefore the civilization that we build is put in place by the powerful in order to oppress people, of course, therefore, the natural conclusion is anything that you get is necessarily going to be baked in with racism. And that's, that's really the claim. Interestingly, you don't have to be a, a, a racist in the traditional sense of the word to be guilty of contributing to systemic racism. So typically we've understood racism to mean I view a person of another race as inferior to me, and I view myself as superior. And there probably comes a host of emotions with that. I don't like this person because they're this race. I don't want to, you know, stoop to this level. All those sorts of ra traditionally racist ways of viewing humanity that as Christians we know are absolutely immoral and repulsive. You don't have to do any of that to be guilty of systemic racism. You simply have to live in the society as a group member of one of the oppressor classes. Regardless, if you, regardless of whether or not you actually love all people, that doesn't count for you 
because you're living in this oppressive uh, system. Next, inequality of outcomes, which another way to say that is simply inequity. The word inequity, or if when we say equity, we simply mean the outcome. Equity and equality are different things, okay? Equality is something we all agree to. We're all equal in, in, God's, in, in God's sight as humans made in the image of God. The idea of equity is that the outcomes of whatever comes out of the work that you put in, the effort that you put in, needs to be, at the end of the day, absolutely equal, regardless of the inputs. And this system views any inequity as the result of racism, necessarily. And so even if you think there may be a more complicated answer to that question, and by the way, I think it is massively more complicated than what critical race theory and systemic justice gives us, but you're not allowed to ask that question. Because again, to ask a question for clarification or to bring a criticism is simply to admit that you are part of the problem and you yourself are corrupt. The assumption is also that if you could remove systemic racism, that inequities would go away. If you could simply alter the system, you could do away with inequity. Well, is it possible, I just asked the question now, that systems can be corrupted to oppress this person or that person or even this group or that group? Absolutely. Our nation has had a terrible history of this in times and in places. And for the Christian, as I say, we believe all people are made in God's image. And I would just say this, wherever there is a policy or a law or some kind of facet of a system that truly is oppressive to people, as a Christian, I think it's our duty to join hands and say, what can we do to fix that? But that is a very different claim from saying the whole system of Western civilization from top to bottom, whether you fly 30,000 foot over and look down from up there, or whether you get right up to the tree with the magnifying glass, you see racism everywhere. Do you, do you follow? That's a very, very different claim. So, as much as some who are adopting these views, I think, probably want to help to dispense of objective truth, to jettison objective truth, to jettison objective morality in the process is far too high a price to pay for any solution that would be offered. C.S. Lewis, by the way, I can't talk without quoting him at some point. So C.S. Lewis, he wrote a book called The Abolition of Man. And in that book, by the way, he had a conversation with one uh, professor and he said at one point that that was the most important book he ever wrote. And he said, the denial of what I'm arguing here would literally lead to the obliteration of Western civilization. And I think he was absolutely bullseye right on that. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. And by the way, his argument in The Abolition of Man is an argument for objective truth and objective morality. That truth is not just what you might approve of in your culture. Morality is not one thing for person A and person B, depending upon what culture they come from. And Lewis saw the devastating consequences that would come inevitably to any culture that embraced that. So here's what he says. We make men without chests. Some of you are familiar with this quote. And then we expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and we are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. What was a man without a chest? A man without a chest was a man that you had convinced that objective truth was not really there, that objective morality was not really there. That's, what, that's the sense in which he's saying we laugh at honor because we would look at honor in a relativistic sense as saying, well, we just chose to prize honor in our culture, but it's not praiseworthy in all cultures. So Lewis just simply says, is it any wonder that when you do that with truth and morality that you shouldn't be shocked to find dishonorable people? And yet you're upset when they're dishonorable. You've torn out their chest. And that's the very thing postmodernism does, and that's the very thing that critical race theory and systemic racism in the way that it's, it truly means the sense of the term, that's what that leads to as well. If honor is an old value held by the oppressors, you got to do away with that as well. Well, quickly here, and I've got, boy, I need to speed along here, Bill, so you can have some, some time. 
intersectionality. We can do this one quickly. Intersectionality simply means, you think of an intersection in a road uh, that you come to, and I'm thinking of the time at George when we rode in your Tesla, which was a great experience for me. We came to some intersections in that car, and I was surprised at how fast you could get that thing going after we'd come through some of them. But an intersection is simply where two roads cross. Intersectionality is saying it's not just race that we need to consider when we look at oppression in our culture. People can be oppressed along all sorts of different lines. So it can be race, it can be gender, it can be religion, it can be immigration status, and, on, and you could really go on uh, to infinity if you wanted to with all of this, but those tend to be the big ones. But again, the problem with intersectionality, now hear me, it dispenses of the individual. If intersectionality is true and we lump, we, what it does is it lumps people into their group identity and that's the primary way that you understand a person. It's not even what Martin Luther King Jr. said where he said, you know, I long for a day when we would judge people not according to the color of their skin but by the content of their character. Intersectionality has no patience for that. You must judge somebody by the color of their skin because they simply are their race and they are their gender and they are their religion. And by the way, I find that if you just dig a little deep underneath this, pop the hood and take a quick look at that, it's incredibly offensive to many people who've given some thought to it. The idea that if I'm just my group, that all my group thinks exactly the same. You, you t I have some black friends I've talked to this about, and they would say, I'm, I'm incredibly offended by that, that you would demand that I must think this way. Who, who's the ultimate authority who tells us what our color has to think like? We know people are far more complicated than that. They're not just their group. They're individuals. And character, I hope, really still matters. Well, that's intersectionality. Um, I've already discussed equality versus equity, so let me, let me move on with that and then come to a close here, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do some discussion in Q&A. The major problem with so much of this, if the problems are, and the way that we must view the world and the ills in the world that we have to deal with, if it is at rock bottom systemic, and that's our real issue, it is literally, and you'll hear Christians talk about systemic sin, you realize one of the massive problems is Christ cannot redeem us from that. Christ came to die for you and for me, for the person. He came and put his life up on a cross to take away the very real sins, down to the minutia, the thoughts that you yourself have thought and entertained and indulged, the words that you have said, the behavior that you've actually acted upon. That's what Christ died for. But this takes the focus off of the individual and the sin which resides in the human heart and puts the spotlight on the system. And the way that you fix sin out there in the system, it, Christ is no help to you with that. That's on us to go and fix that and fix the system, and we are the saviors of sin out in the system. And it's a, it's a devastating thing that happens to Christianity when you work this, self out, this out. Further, you read your Bible, Christ himself used the laws of logic. He spoke reasonably. He didn't contradict himself. He demanded evidence on certain occasions. If the laws of logic and the demand for evidence, as we find in the scientific method, are simply pieces of an oppressive Western civilization, do you know the problem we have with Christ the man? He came as an oppressor. It's devastating for Christianity. People are not just their group, nor are they they're identical with their group's flaws. If they were, Jesus came as a man. Is he therefore guilty of all the sins that men have committed in history before he came? I think not. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in all ways just as we are yet without sin. He came as a Jew. Do the Jews have a spotless history? Not quite. Is he guilty of those because he is one of the group and he's not an individual person? You see what this does for our doctrine of Christ. It obliterates that as well. Further, who's the, per who's the group if you had to pick one in the New Testament that gives Jesus more grief than almost anyone? Somebody say it. It's the Pharisees. Who comes to Jesus at night in John chapter 3 and gets one of the most honest discussions and gets the clearest explanation of the gospel probably than anybody that ever had a conversation with Jesus? Nicodemus the Pharisee. If Jesus had held that man guilty of his group, he'd have turned him away and he'd have said, you need to go fix all the things the Pharisees are doing. He didn't do that. 
He took Nicodemus as a man who had his own concerns, his own flaws, his own questions, and Jesus treated him uh, with intrinsic worth as a real individual, and Nicodemus is the one who gets the answer, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Nicodemus, you must be born again if you want to see the kingdom of heaven. The honesty with which Jesus deals with that individual, Nicodemus. Well, let me bring my time to a close with just a few uh, thoughts here. I've asked myself the question, why is all of this so compelling for Christians? Because we're seeing so many Christians lap this stuff up, I think many of them, in a real desire to do good. So here's just a few thoughts I've had. Number one, I think that the enemy has hoodwinked a lot of well-meaning, compassionate Christians who have not really taken the time to understand these issues. They're told if they don't embrace this, and they get all sorts of pressure from their culture, that they don't have the true gospel, or they're racists. And that's a difficult thing to stomach if you haven't thought it through, and you think, my goodness, I don't want to do that. I, we as Christians, we're, we're against racism. We believe that all people are equal, so if my culture is telling me i got to go this way to do that, well, I better go along. Not realizing the Trojan horse that's been brought in when they bring these ideas in. Maybe some are well-meaning. There's another thing. Another reason I think that some, and let's be honest on this, have a shallow walk with Christ. Some missionaries I've talked to have come from parts of the world where it's difficult, it's costly to be a Christian. They'll come and they'll spend time in America and they'll say something like, the church is a mile wide but inches deep. here." In There's such a shallowness. And it's to our shame that, that that may be true in large part. But I think there's a sh- if there's a shallowness in the life of the Christian, there tends to be a loss of a, f- a sense of a felt meaning and purpose in their life. And this movement, the social justice movement, the woke movement, the critical race theory movement, it gives a very quick and cheap answer to that. It lets them get involved in, in a massive movement that gives them a sense of purpose and meaning like they're a part of something larger than themselves, a sense of real significance. Rod Dreher writes in his book, he says, social justice warrior ranks are full of middle class, secular, educated young people who are racked by guilt and anxiety over their own privilege, alienated from their own traditions, and desperate to identify with something or someone to give them a sense of wholeness and purpose. For them, the ideology of social justice is defined not by the church's teaching, but by critical theorists in the academy functions as a pseudo-religion. Bodhi Bauckham, by the way, if you've read his book, Fault Lines, he mentions the religious overtones of this whole movement. Dreyer points it out, Vodi does, and other authors as well. Well, I think another reason is a desire for virtue, for real virtue in the life of the individual. After we have basically jettisoned uh, a teaching on what virtue really means. You don't hear much about virtue in our culture. You hear all about values. But virtue, even the pagans knew that the purpose in life was, they called it happiness, they simply meant a healthy soul, and they said the way to that was virtue, that you actually conformed your life to the real moral structure that's there in the world that we live in. Now Christianity comes along and says you'll never do that by your own elbow grease, you need Christ for that. But yes, as you come to know Christ, and He's the ultimate fulfillment of your heart, as you follow Him and live for Him, there is great peace and fulfillment in a life of virtue following Christ. Let me close with this, and then uh, Bill, we'll have you come up. Luis Marcos has written a book called Myth Made Fact, and he has one of the most perceptive comments on the, along these lines about the loss of virtue and the gaping hole that it leaves in a person's heart and then what we're seeing in our own culture. He says, speaking of the public school system, after purging their schools of traditional Judeo-Christian and traditional Greco-Roman virtues, The secular progressive architects replaced the virtues with a set of five pseudo-virtues to fill up the virtue-shaped vacuum in our hearts. And here are the virtues. Tolerance, inclusivism, egalitarianism, multiculturalism, and environmentalism. Egalitarianism and multiculturalism do not lead to the affirmation of all that is unique and glorious in masculinity or femininity or in the various cultures of Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. 
but rather it leads to the collapsing of all distinctions in favor of a Marxist identity politics that reduces people to their race, their class, or their gender without imbuing them with any kind of essential worth. Worse yet, the swapping out of traditional virtues with progressive values has helped to create a generation of young people who say to themselves, well, yes, I may be living a sinful lifestyle, but that is okay because I recycle cans. Two full generations have been instructed to feel intense concern for the destruction of the environment and for social justice issues on the other side of the globe while feeling no compunction about indulging their appetites, humiliating their peers, and treating their parents with contempt. In the moral ethical haze that sets in when values take the place of virtues, it becomes all too easy to, and please listen, all too easy to redefine narcissism as self-esteem, envy as fairness, and consumerism as a natural and an inalienable right. And I could say quite a bit more. Let me just say this. The other couple of reasons here, and I won't unpack these, I think for some it's, it's a love of pragmatism over faithfulness. They mean well. They think if they, they jump on the, the woke movement that it will lead to great results, and they've not thought first about is this faithful to what Christ has said. And by the way, we're finding that the pragmatic argument doesn't hold water. Everywhere where this really touches down, it's like an acid that eats away the container. It's not producing unity. It's not bringing people together. It's devastating. And the last, I would simply say, is probably a desire to have a seat at the cultural table, which you could say it this way, a fear of man. Just simply a fear of man, a fear of being labeled this or that or being disagreed with. And I'm saying, friends, as Christians, let's, of course, stand against racism in all its true forms wherever we find it. And uh, let's treat all people as real people made in God's image, just as our Lord did. The same way our Lord did throughout the Gospels. You will never see Jesus embracing anything remotely like uh, what we find in the social justice movement as He deals with humanity. And let's be courageous to do that and really let's get after it in loving people. I think that's a good, a good place to, to take it.